You're now listening to Boomsies with Dan O'Toole on the Bet Rivers Network. It's a 59er. Fifty-nine. Well, it's the Jesse Carlson episode. This is going into the vault for the Jays. His first season with the Blue Jays, he wore 59. He only spent three years in the big leagues, all with the Jays. 20, 2008 to 2010, the bad uniform years. And he has a special place in MLB history because he is the first pitcher in MLB history to enter a game and with the bases loaded, none out, and struck out the side on 12 pitches in his third appearance. Very specific stat. But one I guarantee anyone listening does not have that on their resume. But Jesse Carlson does. Entered a game, bases loaded, extra innings, none out, struck out the side on 12 pitches. So right there, that's reason enough to have him as the person in which podcast number 59 of Boomsies is named after. Now we're doing kind of a different Boomsies this week because we have a very special guest. And I'm not sure if our guest and Jesse Carlson's timeline overlapped in Toronto. So you're like, oh, who is it? Well, I guess if you're reading the description of the podcast, you already know. But maybe you, you just go in blind. You hit that Boomsies play button without looking at anything. So you will be surprised then that I tell you our guest this week is former Blue Jays manager, John Gibbons. Gibby. So the question is, did your time and Jesse Carlson's time overlap at all? Yeah, yeah. Jesse played for me. Uh, the, he, the, uh, the old lefty man, the most, one of the most durable guys I ever had. He wasn't, he wasn't a very big guy, but he, I tell you, he was the ultimate gamer, man. So were yes, you were you the manager of the game in which he struck out the side with the bases loaded in extra innings in his third appearance? How did it have to be? What year was that? Yeah, that was 08. Well, I had yeah, it would have had to have been. I got fired in June, in the June of 08, but that there was you yeah. Go. Okay. Yeah. How about that? I think he got a save too in Kansas City because who was it? We somebody our closer was on a we we're trying to strike. Maybe it was BJ Ryan at the time. He was coming back from elbows and or, or one, whoever our closer was, but they were come back from injury. So we had to make sure they pitched every certain days. Right. So we're on the road. We had to make sure he pitched in the eighth inning, make sure he got his work in it. I think Jesse might've shut it down anyway. That's great. See hey, everything. Hey. The stars, stars align. <laughs> Speaking of stars, Jose Batista joining yeah. the level of excellence. You got to be proud of that. Oh yeah, hey, well, well deserved. You know he uh, he's right up there with the, the all time great Blue Jays. You know, and uh, you know what, Dan, I I tell people all this time when they talk about it, the one thing about Jose, I remember most. You know, I mean, I'm obviously the great player, and you know his career. I mean, it wasn't easy for him, right? He was a journeyman kind of and a utility type player. That's a, that's what he was labeled as early on, but he thought so much more of himself, and he really got to start in Toronto under Cito Gaston. You know, and uh, but he's probably my number one guy on my list. Not probably is a guy that's showing up to play and ready to play every day because he was going to maximize everything he had. He, he feel, I think he felt he had some lost years there, you know, from not getting an opportunity to be an everyday player. And uh, it, it was amazing. He never had to worry about him getting banged up, not playing, you know, and he also understood that, you know what fans come to see him play. Yep. This is the third guy that you coached or managed that will join the level of excellence, joining Carlos Delgado and Roy Halladay. Carlos Delgado, in my mind, had the nicest swing I've ever seen in person. I agree. I agree. Yeah, he, I, You know, Dan, you talk about effortless, man. And you know what? Carlos wasn't just a slugger, man. He was a great hitter. You know, I was coaching first base that they gave me pop four home runs. Yeah, and I'll just sit there and watch, man. It's, good. it's like <laughs> it's like amazing. But you know what? Uh, you know what else Carlos did? I had never seen a player do right. Is he kept this little book booklet in in the uh, dugout with him, and he had always marked down how certain pitchers pitched him, right? And then like next time, next time we faced him in a series, he'd mark, write a little bit more. So he always had that to go go back to. You know, he was he was really he was a student of hitting. You know, and um, but I saw him in the A ball. When he's playing for Dunedin and he was a catcher, right? 
And big guy, and, uh, and I can remember, and he 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 was he was dominating that league, right? I was a roving instructor for the in the Met system, and I thought, dang, this guy's awful big to be a catcher, you know? It might might catch up with him, right? And then uh, of course, then they they moved him, but I said, this guy's un, un, unreal, you know. And the other guy that I one of the one of the, there's two guys that I remember in A ball that really stood out like that. The other guy was Adrian Beltre. He was in. Um, when I was managing one year, he was with the Dodgers in the Florida State League in Vero Beach. But those are the two guys I remember the most at that level. You're going, wow. How about Roy Halladay? Speaking of student of the game, is it true that every spring training he would read the same book about pitching? Yeah, it was a guy, Harvey Dorfman. It was a, he's a, it was a, uh, like a psychology guy, right? It's like sports psychologist. He worked with Oakland. And, and then I don't know how he got – I don't know how – Roy got a hold of it, uh, but I think Chris Carpenter as well, you know, would he delved into that and it really, really set both those guys off to, you know, different, different levels And Roy. Uh, yeah, that was, that was his pitching Bible, man. And, you yeah. know, Roy, Roy was, uh, uh, he was definitely an introvert. He keep to himself, but you know, on again, he, he wouldn't say my, on a day he wasn't pitching, put it this way. He wouldn't say a whole lot of words anyway. He might stop by the office and see, and see how he's doing. The day he was pitching, he ain't going to say one word, you know, no. And it was kind of uncomfortable cro crossing his path. If you're going through the clubhouse, right. Cause he's so, he's so locked in. You can see like fire in his eyes, man. You go, oh, he's ready. I love when hitters describe facing him. They said it was like he was on top of them. Yeah. You know, I mean, he's a big guy and, you know, they all have different, different release points. And some of them look like they're, they're really right there on top of you more than others. And he had that. And, hey, you know, Roy, it wasn't the easiest road for Roy either. You know, he went all the way, remember, he all went all the way back down to A-ball and uh, resurrected his career and came, you know, Hall of Famer type. Then know? almost had a uh, no-hitter in his first game in the bigs. Yeah, exactly. Two out of the ninth or something. Yep. Gibby, I got your book here. I've got Ooh, a lot. Who's it was, it was that handsome guy, man? I know. Hey, don't, you, hey don't you dare cover your face with that book, man. You can't do I that. Uh, you're wearing the good Blue Jays uniforms, not the uh, the. Uh, you were there for part of the ugly period of jerseys, black jersey. Yeah. Ah, uh, whose idea was that? J.P. Ricciardi. No, don't don't put that one on. <laughs> okay, so I got a little higher up. As I I read the whole thing, um, I had questions that I jotted down while reading. It. Okay, so you were a catcher. Well, did you enjoy it? By the way, I did. I loved it. It's a great read. All right, good. I I discovered during the book that you were the manager for four monumental moments in Blue Jays history: the Batista home run, the Batista punch, the Ted Lilly altercation, and the Shea Hillenbrand. Um, this is a sinking ship, which it turns out in the book he didn't even write that on the board. So four iconic moments of the Jays you were there for. Hey, you know what the, the sad thing about that sinking ship? Uh, he was he was kind of right, man. That, that baby, <laughs> that thing was taking on water. <laughs> yeah. I once went to Shea Hillenbrand's house in Arizona, and he has horses in his house. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, I heard like he he, was, uh, he married a girl. Their father was a vet or something. They took all these animals in or something. Yeah, they have miniature horses. They have tortoises. Very wild. Okay, That's so you, were, you know what? <laughs> that is a little odd, but you yeah, know. you were a catcher. How are your knees, and how do your knees hold up during a season? You know, Dan's funny. I, my knees have always been, you know, for some reason I never had any problems with them until late. You know, I'm starting to notice. And I mean, I got a little bow in my leg. I walked a little bow legged. In. But now every every uh, three months I go to the orthopedic surgeon. He gives me cortisone shots in both of them. And then, of course, a couple of my shoulders. And so that's kind of my treatment right now. And eventually probably going to need some new ones, I guess. Your big league career was thwarted by Gary Carter. He even took your number. Yeah, well, I guess. <laughs> I don't think anybody's going to complain about that. You know what? No. Uh, he didn't thwart it. He, yeah, he, he was a little roadblock at the time. But, you know, if I had played better, I'd have got an opportunity probably somewhere else. Not with the Mets, that's for sure. But, uh, you know what? He was the best player in the game at the time, best catcher in the game. And uh, I've always, I was always a big fan. So, you know, that's that was the move that really put the Mets over the top, you know, when they acquired him and, and um, turned him into a different team. You have to be one of the few people in the world to have ever seen country music legend Charlie Pride singing in the shower. Oh, yeah. Hey, you're right, because I was the only one in there with him. <laughs> That's oh, right. Charlie. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was also in the shower. The only one in the shower was Sandy Koufax one day. He, he was working for the Dodgers in 88, and I was playing in Albuquerque with the Dodgers AAA. And he looks at me, he says, kid, and he said, I've had enough of this crap, you know. Basically, I said, 
I said, really? I said, I have two. I'm still playing. At least you've done something in your career, you know? Yeah, but yeah, those two. But hey, Charlie, you know, the funny thing about Charlie Pride, I'd seen him a couple years before that at the, you know, every year before spring training would start, the the livestock ro show and rodeo, and right, I say that right, would come through San Antonio. It's a big, one of the bigger rodeos in the country, right? Calgary's the biggest one in the world, and like uh, San Antonio's like number two or three, but and then we saw Charlie Pride, you know, and I always liked his music, right? Then he used to play, the Rangers would always bring him to spring training because he played some pro ball and he just kind of hang out. What a wonderful guy, but I'd seen him at the rodeo and now I'm seeing him in the freaking shower, you know, and he's singing. Can't remember what he was singing, you know, but uh, it's like, damn, that's Charlie, you know? <laughs> that's amazing. Uh, your first coaching job was with Ron Washington. There's just yes. something about that guy where you, I'm like, I would, I would pay money to hang out with him for an hour. Hey, Dan, he's one of the most entertaining guys, the funniest guys, and the hardest working guys you'll you'll ever come across, you know. And uh, it was it was uh, I think he said in the books, probably my most entertaining year in baseball for for a number of reasons. But uh, we became pretty good friends, and you know he he's had a tremendous career, you know, and uh, you know he even got to the World Series a couple times with the Rangers as a manager. And but you, you look at him everywhere he goes. Look at the infields that mm -hmm. he's coached. You know, they're all they're all top notch. Oh, his uh, infield drills, I've seen them. Like hands yeah. like butter. Yeah, ex exactly. You know, he's got he's got. And you know what? Them guys show up. The guys believe in him. They they go out there every day and they do their routine. And uh, he's had many a Gold Glove winner. You and I have both worked with Frank Thomas. I worked with him at Fox, and you worked with him for the Jays. Um, uh -huh. One of the I put on his suit jacket once. <laughs> and it was the the biggest moment in which I did not feel like a man. That's a that's a big man, ain't it? Oh man, I felt like I felt like a little boy. But you know, he's he was like a gentle giant. He was great. He was so nice. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, he was a pretty good football player his day too, there down there at Auburn, you know, university. And uh, but you know, you look at uh, you know, of course I managed him at the tail end of his career and uh kind of left on a sour note there at the end with us. And, but then went to went to Oakland, but you know you just you just watch the guy, you know, and and watch him work on his hitting and things like that. And uh, there's a reason, you know, there's a reason he was so good. And he, we were in Minnesota when I was managing him when he hit his was his 500th, yeah, in the mm -hmm. in Metro. Yeah, so I was there watching. And then his next at bat, he got he got thrown out of the game, <laughs> arguing balls and strikes on that monument monumental day. What was the fastest Mark Burley start that you saw? Did he ever go under two hours? Oh, guarantee it. I should have. I, I couldn't tell you what it was, but there's, he had to. Have. Um, the pitch I, clock was made for him. Oh, yeah. You know what, Dan? I think I might have saw, was it, we might have faced him when he was with the White Sox. Halliday might have been pitching. They both may have got up against each other. And it was like, and they, the game flew by, you know. I think I think it was that matchup. Um, you know, well, he was still a, uh, white Sox. I tell you what, he, he is, he may be my all time favorite player. You know, he's in the top two or three the guys I manage, you know, it's like, he's a manager's dream, man. No yeah. problems. Does a quick start. Oh, gets everyone. You know, home he's, quick. He's, 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 give me the ball, man. He goes out there and does this thing. You know, he, he, uh, you know, he got, he got, he didn't make, he got, he got cut by his high school team, you know, uh, and he, you know, three years in a row, right, or, or two years in a row in, in his sophomore, junior year. And he his, The only reason he went out for the team his senior year, I guess, was his dad asked him to do it, right? And he goes and pitches, and then he goes off to college. And you, you look at his career, man, and in the the number of years he threw 200 innings, I mean, he's a freak. One mm -hmm. no-hitter, perfect game, World Series champ. I almost I, – you know what, Dan? I, I don't think he's, he's he gets the recognition he deserves. He doesn't want it. You know, he's a low-key guy. But he's uh, uh, there's nobody better. Put it that way. I mentioned the pitch clock, how it was made for him. Your thoughts oh. on the pitch clock? You know that that's for, of the rule changes. That one probably bothers me the least. You know, something over, over the years. You know, the play at the plate and the slide rule at second base. But you know, right now, it's, I think it's probably working pretty good. And the, and the guys will make adjustments. If that's the rules. That's the rule. It doesn't mean you have to like it, but. You know, I, I've seen too many times you get late in the game, big game, especially you start getting in the postseason. You get a lot of times these these re, the, your top relievers they take a little more time. You know, the game's on the line; they're one inning guys. 
you know, everybody's got sports psychologists and psychologists will tell you, Hey, breathe, take your time, be focused, whatever, don't rush, whatever, what have you, you know. So that'll be the test, right? When you get Nate. Now, if, if if you penalize somebody in a crucial part of a World Series game, you know, all hell might break loose, right? It might look like that uh, fifth game against the Rangers in 2015 where the place was, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, but, yeah, Burley, it didn't bother Burley. But there's something to work it fast. I think it helps pitchers. But I do know there's certain guys that have to take their time because that's just that's how they do it. If they're if they're too fast, they they can't they're not successful. So you mentioned uh, the Rogers Center of Rock, and you said in your book you could feel the concrete shaking. So after the Batista home run, the place is shaking. I wouldn't be able to sleep for a week. How how do you possibly come back to earth after a moment like that? Well, I wasn't sleeping anyway, man. <laughs> when you manage a big league club, man, there's so much going on here. It's hard to yeah. sleep anyway. Yeah, you know what? Uh, you know, at the end of a regular season anyway, you know, if, even if it's not, not very good, it takes a while to decompress, right? But then after that season, especially because that was towards the end of it all, it took me a while to, you know, decompress, you know? And uh, But it was such a, it was such a, uh, such a big moment, not only in my career, but it had been 23 years, right, since the team had been to the postseason. Right? It's a, one of the biggest moments in baseball history. It's iconic. Yeah. Yeah. The way in the, in the, you know, big Jose doing his thing. And uh, yeah, it was so much drama to the thing. Right. And uh, yeah, that's, 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 that's my fondest memory. That's for sure. Uh, the Toronto Blue Jays have a new spring training facility. How bad was the old one? Oh gosh. <laughs> but, you know, we, we made it, you know, we made it work. Right. You know yeah. what? Uh, yeah, I haven't seen, I've seen pictures of the new one. They say it's unbelievable, but you know, the, the old one, you know, you start out on the minor league side when you get down there for the first uh, week, 10 days, right? And you got four, four fields. That's, that's standard, but other organizations had more. But then after that, we had to move to that, the other, the other side. So the minor leaguers could come in because they had so many guys and over on the, uh, where we were, you had the stadium where you play the games. Then you had two half fields, right? And one and one of the you should, but the, really you can only use one because the other half they'd set it up for all, all the media stuff, the filming, you know, all the stuff for the season. So we couldn't even use that half the time, and so it was it, it was tough to make it work. But we made it work, and it didn't didn't really affect us. But it it was way overdue. And I can remember, you know, they were always talking about moving to a different part of Florida, what have you. And uh, eventually they got it done, you know. And uh, but. The new place is unbelievable. I heard that they're going to re renovate the new the new stadium. They're doing that right now. I mean, not the new stadium, Rogers Center or Sky Dome. What do we call it? Rogers, Rogers Center. Center. Yeah. So you know that's supposed to be nice. Um, uh, there's nothing wrong with saving a little of that money and spending it on players, though. You know, yeah, exactly. Concession stands. <laughs> yeah, I know. Lower your concession prices. Hey, Gibby, you ready for rapid fire Canadian edition? Can I, yeah, oh yeah, I'm gonna try. Okay, what's your Tim Hortons order? Oh, I, I get uh, a nice, a large cup of coffee with cream and a one of those honey crullers. Okay, you know, I was just in Ottawa. Hey, Dan, I was just in Ottawa last week, and my wife's a photographer. We should go up there. We're shooting snowy owls, right? But every morning we go out, and then we she do that for a couple hours, and we go back to the hotel. And on the way, there's a Tim Hortons. That's what we had every day, <laughs> week straight, baby. How many times have you been up the CN Tower? Once. Favorite Canadian city that's not Toronto? Gosh, I got to say back Vancouver. It's gorgeous. What yeah. is in poutine? What is in it? Yeah. Hey, you know, you know what? I did not have poutine till my last year in Toronto. My kids came up. That was, I'd always heard about it. I never, and I saw it on, Menus at restaurants, but I, ne I never had it until we tried it. So I can't tell you what's on. It's different stuff, right? It's uh, French fries, yeah. gravy, and cheese curds. It's pretty simple. I mean, they do it on, but but there's different. Don't they have different flavors of it? Or something? No. They you can get ones that have meat in them, and but the basic okay. is fries, gravy, cheese curds. Uh, what's your favorite Canadian chocolate bar? Oh gosh, I used to eat it all the time. Uh, gosh, it was some kind of uh, chocolate bar that had peanuts in it and. Uh, it almost looked like a it's almost like a baby Ruth bar in the States. I can't think of the name of it. Oh Henry? Oh Henry. Oh Henry's. Uh have you ever had a beaver tail? It's a it's a pastry. It's kind of like a elongated donut that's 
flattened out and it has like you can get powdered sugar on it you can get cinnamon and sugar oh where do they sell those at uh they sell them in toronto but mainly ottawa uh have you ever a met grocery drake? store yeah, not at the grocery store have you ever met drake no have you ever met getty lee Yes, yes, yes. I had lunch with him a couple of times and he came out to the stadium. You know what? Hey, Getty gave me a ball, a Hall of Fame, Rush Hall of Fame ball. He signed all three bandmates, members, signed it for when they went to the Hall of Fame. Wow. Uh, That's Facebook- probably my biggest thrill ever, man, in Toronto, because I grew up on Rush. Rush Rush was big down here in San Antonio, oh, Texas. Massive. Have you ever seen them in concert? Yes. You know, when I got rehired in, in uh, coming back in 13, that that winter they they came through San Antonio, so I just been hired. So I contacted our PR guy, and they lined up tickets, and uh, so we went to the went to the concert. And then afterwards, you know, got to go backstage with him. And all Getty wanted to do was talk about baseball, man. And, and to, he's I mean he's in I mean he's smart baseball guy, yeah. right? I said, damn, this guy ought to be managing the team for crowd. I'd switch spots with him. But... It was the first band I'd ever seen in concert where I wasn't a fan of the band. Saw them in concert, I'm like, these guys are fantastic. They sound better than the album. Um, your favorite Canadian baseball player? Oh, it's got to be, uh, gosh, that's some good ones. It might got to be Maddie Stairs. Yeah. Been another, yeah, you know, Maddie, I got something for Maddie. There's been so many good, you know, Jeff Francis is another one of my, I got to put Francis in there too. Uh, Corey Kosky. Oh, yeah. You know, he going, I'm going to tell you one thing about the, uh, in, in the, so many more Can- Canadian guys are playing the game, right? But the guys that were in there, my time in in the big leagues is, I mean, they were they were good, impactful players. They weren't just like your average Joe players, man. These guys were good, you know. Joey Votto, to, you know, uh, uh, in the Hall of Famer, uh, Expos, left handed hitter, the all time. Not Larry Walker. Larry Walker, sorry, Larry, but yeah, there's uh, so many good ones. But yeah, I got to go Francis and Stairs. Uh, have you ever had a butter tart? The heck! You, I've never heard of that either, man. What am oh, I? What must have missed out? Ah, oh, geez. Well, I'm just. I have a sweet tooth, so yeah, as you can tell. What? Hey, no more than me, man. <laughs> I must have um, been sleeping all morning. Never got out to get him. And your final rapid fire question: Greatest Blue Jay of all time? Wow. I'll show you mine while I, you think. No, I might. No, no, I'm. I'm have to but, go Delgado, no, man. But, like who my favorite is. Garth. Is that Garth? Garth Orch. Garth. Hey, you know what? You know what? You think about it. There's so much great history with the Blue Jays. You know, um, in, 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 in a, they brought guys in and out, and they weren't all there necessarily for a long time. But it's it's incredible that the guys that have come through that town and played, you know. You never have uh, named one yet, though. I just think Delgado might be my. Uh, uh, okay. Hold on. Let me see. Who are you taking? Gar- Garth Orge. <laughs> you know why I like him? Maybe, I, 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 oh, I love Garth, but I, I'm, I'll put Garth second. You'll respect this because you know why I love them watching him play? I'm like, this guy, there's, every player's more talented, but he's busting his ass every single day. He's showing up, and he still has a spot on this team, and it gave me a dream where I'm like, I could maybe make it to the big leagues if I just work hard. Hey, you know what? When my first year coaching, Garth was coaching first base there. But Buck, uh, Buck was managing the team. Buck Martinez. Yeah. And then when, when Buck got fired on June first, I think it was. It, you know, of course Garth was his guy, so Garth went with him. You know. Hey, Robbie Alomar, man, you got to look at Robbie too. You know, and uh, they've been, they've had so many good. I'm a huge. Uh, you know, there's just so many. You know, Joe Carter. You know, I mean, he had the historic home run. Uh, well, I grew know, up watching my, my my favorite team of all time for the Jays is the '85 Jays. No offense to teams you manage, but that's where I fell in love with baseball. And what about George Mo- Bell, Mosby, Barfield, uh, and Bell. That was in my mind the greatest outfield of all time. And what about Dave Steed, man? Dave yeah. Steed, man. I always thought he threw a curve, but that was a slider. The thing that fell yeah. off the table. You know, Hinky Ward, all that. I mean, you you name it. They just kept coming at you back Steve then. Steve you know? is the most underrated pitcher. We talked about yes. underrated players. Steve is the most underrated pitcher of all time, I think. Yeah, you're you're right. You're right. You know, it's and, because the media did not like him, and he didn't like the media. Well, that's yeah, that's the way it works. You know, yeah, if they uh, if you rub them wrong, yeah, you know, Gibby, your book is out now. Yeah, look at that teeth, man. Look at them. See, I, my mother was a dental hygienist. She made sure I 
either brush my teeth or I got fake teeth. <laughs> so Gibby's book is out and you can catch his podcast, the, the Gibby show as well. Yes. And then we'll see. Uh, I'm assuming you're going to be there for Batista's big unveiling of the level of excellence. I, I know you never know, but I would love to. Okay. Well, we really appreciate this, my friend and uh, wish you all the best, a great read. And I couldn't put it down. I'm, Usually you flip through these things, preparing for a guest. I'm like, I'm reading this whole damn thing. Hey, a lot of people thought it might end up being a color book, you know? <laughs> <laughs> See you, buddy. Gibby, what a guy. Uh, let's get to our viewer uh, voicemails and emails. We got a bit of time here. Uh, remember, you can win a CHL prize pack. 289-796-2001. And we've got a voicemail this week. Um, vying for that CHL prize pack. Why don't we have a listen? Hey, Dan, producer Tim, Z Money. Uh, this is your buddy, Joe Archer, calling. I'm just calling about two things. One was that Live Golf promo. I got to say, Dan, you got to not poo-poo on them too much because, you know, they're at least trying something different. So the promo that was, uh, you know, it could have had something better to it, you know, like with the, the especially I loved the music in the background from uh, Half Dollar Out the Club. That was perfect. Um, but, man, uh, they could have definitely – given maybe the golfers a little heads up or maybe chose some more with charisma, not blaming them. You know what? They are amazing golfers. So they, they got what they're going. You know, I remember in high school, um, there were some guys that couldn't put pen to paper, but you know what? They could smell your exhaust from your car and they could tell you that there's a screw loose in your glove compartment and tell you that there's a spark plug that only fires 688 times out of three revolutions. They knew what's up. They have their strengths. We all have our strengths and we all have our weaknesses. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up to you was about the CFL. You're trying to figure out why isn't it popular in Canada, and I think I have it. It's culture. Nobody that comes to Canada that goes, football, that's what we play here. I don't think anybody does. When you're born in Canada, you go, I'm going to go on the football field. Not at all. And I think that's the troubling hard part to get past. Once you get past that culture thing, I think it'll go uh, up you know, it'll go up from here. And then the last thing I was going to put to that, the Argos were at least trying when they had their football games going. They had $5 beers, $5 dogs, I think it's $5 something. Else. Everything for $5. Not like if you go to Blue Jays or a Leafs game where it's like uh, you go for a beer and they go, okay, that'll be $10 and 10 more dollars. And then you're just like, okay, well, that's great. Anywho, love the pod. Love you guys. Hopefully everything's good. Uh, talk later. Bye. Okay, a few things to unpack here. Um, uh, got, uh, actually a lot of comments about the live tour and, uh, talking about their promo. Uh, we'll dive into that in a second. Uh, the CFL, it's not a cultural, but the CFL, the great cup is the oldest trophy in sports. So, but yeah, I never grew up like me and my buddies never said, let's go throw the football around. We'd play baseball or we'd play hockey. And the $5 thing, uh, his prices are wrong about uh, Leafs game or Jays game. It's more than $10 for a, a beer. I think they're like uh, 20 bucks now. Okay, well, he's trying. Hey, I want nothing but the league to succeed. Not having their games on TV, or I guess someone told me they are on TV, but they only have one broadcast partner. That was a mistake. You need to widen the umbrella, as they say. Here's another uh, viewer feedback about the, the live tour. Cause I dove into their promo. They put out how it was made by a 12 year old. Hello, Boomsies crew. I feel like you contradicted yourself explaining the live tour and comparing it to the PGA tour. First, you say the winner last weekend can thank the live tour for the big purse, but then you go on to say that live will always be irrelevant. Yes, I said that. Well, it looks like they are already relevant to the PGA Tour. Correct. Good point. I'm I'm here. I'm going into this with an open mind. As for the point scoring, that is no different than the PGA Tour and the FedEx Cup. Players are awarded points based on where they finish, and the player with the most points at the end of the season is the FedEx Cup winner. The last three tournaments of the year have the field decided by those player points. Okay, we're, we're going deep here. Yes, I will admit that the who team movement thing is a little different, but each team has a captain and they get to decide. 
the XFL has to do, XFL has, has had to, to explain the rule changes. They just did it differently. It's not the same as the NFL and the point after attempt does have different scenarios with different point values. The difference is they decided not to use the video to explain them. True. I don't follow or watch live, but I feel you should at least admit you don't enjoy live instead of making it seem like what they have going is so confusing, despite many similarities between themselves and the PGA tour. Enjoy the podcast and keep up the great work cam. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to admit that I don't enjoy the live cause I've never watched it. So you're right, Cam. Maybe, uh, maybe I should give it a shot. Maybe I got bogged down and they're explaining how the team format works. And yes, the PGA Tour can be thankful that they exist because their purses have grown exponentially. Hey, Tulsi, just listen to episode 58 and I, come up, uh, I came up with a Live Golf slogan. Live Golf, we suck, we know it, and soon you will too. I can hear the money being printed with that gem, Boomsies. Our buddy, Big Dog Rob. Okay, I'm going to give Live Tour, uh, if I can find it on the TV, on the old uh, WB. Don't know if I get that channel. I'm on the basic cable system. So not sure that uh, not, uh, not sure that channel's on there. Maybe if it's played on CHCH, Hamilton Station. Is it, Tim? Does the Live Tour pick up? Okay. Hey, boys, it's Keenan here. Good to hear from you guys in my ears once again. Missed y'all. Well, one, what the heck is Tim talking about? Always wondered what he sounds like, and now I know. I always picture an 80-year-old boomer who would yell at you and Jay at the old network, smoked a ton of darts, always be drunk at work, as well as would abuse you and Jay. Well, after hearing his voice, I was wrong. He sounds great. Nothing like I was expecting. That's a boomsies. Also, Tim, my question for the pod is how do you deal with Dan and Jay constantly talking <laughs> All the stories I've heard about you now and I uh, realize are most likely not true, but how did you deal with them? Were they the complete holes <laughs> instead of you? As well as are you actually a foot guy? Because that's some interesting stuff and man, they threw you under the bus big time. Dan, don't you deny these facts and be nice to Tim, okay? He can f- you over big time as a producer all the best cheers boys keenan tim your response uh tim's logged in as a producer he's not being recorded but his response was uh what's that tim jay and dan awesome guys to work with i was always the whole not them And my goal going to work each night was to try and annoy them as much as I could. And I succeeded. Those words straight from Tim into my ear to you. Glad we could clear that up. (laughs) Hi, Dan. I have a solution for your menu item at Cousin Eric's restaurant. My cousin Eric was on Friday, uh, Friday, Friday. He's opening a restaurant at the Sensplex in Ottawa. So he has a menu item at Eric's restaurant. Boomsies sharp cheddar mac and cheese. I'm suggesting a homemade version with some real sharp cheddar and maybe some toasted panko breadcrumbs on top. They'd be lined up all the way out the Sensplex doors for a taste of that cheesy goodness. All right-minded people know that sharp cheddar is the king of craft dinners. Never mind producer Tim's boring preference for the original KD flavor. Switching topics. We all understand that the Boston Bruins were good. Now even their goalie can score. Rest of the NHL, you're done! Did you, during your goaltending career, ever come close to scoring? Cheers, Drew from Toronto. No, I didn't, Drew. Great menu item. Throw some uh, some wieners in there. Throw some crispy hot dogs, like burnt hot dogs, where they're busting out of their casing. Then you've got a a Boomsies menu item. Hey, Dan, if you're struggling to find a professional ball or hockey player to name episode 59 of Boomsies after, I have a suggestion for you, me. I grew up playing hockey in a small town of Saskatchewan called Redvers, home of former Winnipeg Jets captain Dean Kennedy. Played hockey for 14 years, always wearing the old 59. I had never made it out of my small town because, quite frankly, I sucked at hockey. However, if you named episode 59 after me, I would be honored. I would bask in my 15 minutes of Boomsies fame. Thank you for consideration, Lonnie. Lonnie, honorary 
episode 59. You got it. Hey, Toolsy. Producer Tim. Zed Money. Just listening to the interview with Nate Thompson about being traded, and you asked the question, does the team help you move? Nate said, yes. My question is, which team helps with the move? I uh, sent Nate a, uh, a text after getting this email. Nate said, the team you're traded to helps with the move. Does the trading team just cut you loose like it was real good luck out there? It was real good luck out there. Or do they try to help soften the blow by taking care of the logistics? Or does the team you're being traded to say, yes, guy, welcome aboard. We got you. Great interview. Really humanized the business side of hockey. Scott from Yellowknife. So yeah, team you're traded to, they got you. Hey, we got you. That's what I was telling my kids. Hey, I got you. Fire off a couple more here, boys. Girls. Where was it? There we go. Hey, Dan. Longtime fan of yours. Huge fan of the pod. Big shout out to Bet Rivers for allowing you, Tim, and Z Money to do your thing with virtually no interference or corporate red tape. Bet Rivers. Great suits. Even better podcasts. Bumsies! There's your new slogan. I had a thought that I wanted to share about fixing those awful Hyundai WA commercials. Hyundai. It's, uh, like Sunday, but Hyundai. I always remember that. All they need to do is bring in Patrick Waugh as a spokesperson. Boomsies! Fixed. Think of all the possibilities. Picture a car about to slide off the road during a blizzard. Kids terrified in the back seat as the car is drifting sideways towards a snowbank. Miraculously, the driver, who is Patrick Waugh, recovers thanks to the driver-assisted technology and pulls the car right back into the lane. Waugh with the save! Instantly hilarious. Keep up the great work and congrats on the two-year anniversary. Cheers, Joel from Innisfil. Innisfail or Innisfil? Innisfail, I think. <clears throat> hey, Dan. Bonjour, Dan. Sorry. And Boomsies Boys. The Boomsies Boys. Why did I say bonjour? I don't know. To be different. Anywho, I just went out for a rip in this official blizzard. Luckily, my car laughs at snow and refuses to get stuck. I went to the local Tim's to get myself an iced coffee. Yes, I'm one of those people that drink cold things on cold days and warm things on warm days. I'm strange like that. Even the Tim's employee gave me the, are you serious look? So, while I was waiting for my refreshing iced coffee, I heard two people walk into Tim's and one was telling the other, I can only describe that as whiteout conditions. It's like driving through milk. I literally, rough quote, a literal rough quote of my last email to you boys. Have I started a new trend? This one guy must have been a fellow Boomsies listener. If you're listening to this right now, I hear you and appreciate the milk driving reference. Because let's be honest here, it's really bad out there right now. You could tape a white piece of paper to your face on a clear day and go for a drive and see more than you do right now. Please don't try that, folks. That'd be a bad idea. Hope that uh, brought you some joy and put a smile on your face that yet again in a storm, two Boomsies listeners bumped into each other. Assuming he was a listener, because if he wasn't, then, well, that'd be strange. Do snowstorms bring the Boomsies listeners out in force so your odds of bumping into one go up? Because as of right now, as of right now, I'm two for two. Hope you and the boys stayed in during these, this storm and are safe. Sea bass, our buddy. Uh, one more. Just listen to your latest episode and feel like uh, if no one's going to stand up for my beer bellied, mustachio wearing, expressionless Polish ancestors, I'll be the guy. Your cousin is a moron. <laughs> This is in reference to my cousin, Eric, who is uh, recently in Poland. Imagine being a non-English speaking tourist showing up in Hamilton in the middle of winter, then being confused by the lack of tourism proceeding to shit on the entire country because you don't know how to use Google to find a decent restaurant or look up a menu item. That's basically what he did. It's people like that who give North American tourists a bad rap. This goes as more of a general PSA. If you're traveling somewhere you've never been, please, for the love of God, spend an hour or two planning it at home. It's not up to the locals to be your chaperone once you get there. Thank you for listening to my TED Talk. I'd say cheers, but in solidarity with my frowny-faced brothers and sisters, I'll leave it with an annoyed grunt. Mike. <laughs> uh, love it. 
Okay, uh, our CHL prize pack winner this week. The winner is Z Money is the uh, the overruler of this. We're going with Keenan and his producer Tim email. Ah, uh, yes, Keenan wondering all about producer Tim when in fact we learned producer Tim all along has been the bad guy. That's really, uh, we aren't learning anything new here. Uh, Gibby, pick up his book. What a guy. And we have a very special episode of Friday Friday coming out this week in which we talk to former NHLer and all around interesting guy, Brooks Like. And I got to tell you, if you don't know or have never heard from Brooks Like, He's about to change your life. Or he's going to have you look at life differently. He's got it all figured out, I think. I think he's got it all figured out. In the meantime, give someone a hug. If you see producer Tim out there in the wild, give him a hug. He loves hugs. He's like Olaf. And be nice. Doesn't cost you anything. See you later. Welcome to Boomsies with Dan O'Toozy. Live from Orno in the heart of Ontario. Oh, baby, Boomsies. Thanks for listening to Boomsies with Dan O'Toole on the Bet Rivers Network.